I'm Mark Canoe. You may have seen me in such fine quality educational videos as Mr. Bill and Safety in the Lab and Why Did That Tackle Box Explode? Okay, today I want to finish off the rest of chapter 10 with you guys. And um, I'm not here, obviously, so I figured I'd go ahead and give a little chat here and wear my UCLA cap while I'm at it. Go Bruins. Woo! Okay. So we've been talking about how matter behaves in chapter 10. We've talked about uh, how matter will behave in terms of a liquid, a solid, a gas. We looked at the kinetic theory, and we know that the atoms and the molecules, also known as particles, uh, you know, they're constantly moving. Okay, in those, and then we looked about phase changes, <coughs> and we got into things like diffusion. And you may remember yesterday I, I put in a. Uh, Rat cylinder, put water in there, put some food coloring, and you guys got to watch that, amongst other things uh, that had been mixing or dissolving, as you know, I can point out on the desk there. But we left off at diffusion, where a solute that has a high concentration uh, goes toward an area of low concentration. Solute is what gets dissolved, so we can talk about sugar in water, salt in water, instant coffee in water. Uh, we can also talk about that in terms of gases like perfume. Somebody walks into the room and they're wearing a lot of perfume and within seconds you are smelling it and you're 25 feet away. Okay, that would be an example of diffusion and you find that in real life it is in a number of things. We also talked a little bit about evaporation where basically you have got the molecules at the surface of a liquid, they get enough energy to leave and go and join with the gases. And we talked about what affects evaporation rates like the surface area. The more surface area, it's going to make easier to evaporate things because there's a wider area. Temperature, the higher the temperature, stop and think about the more energy you have, which would encourage evaporation, and of course humidity, that would make things a little bit harder because if there is more humidity, more water vapor in the air, it makes it kind of hard for the liquids to go into gases. Okay, and we talked about volatility. Okay, and then here we talk about sublimation. A solid becomes a gas. Okay, that's nice. A great example is dry ice, and what you're seeing there is the clouds. That's not carbon dioxide going from a solid to a gas, because it skips the liquid phase. What you're seeing there is the condensation of water because it's so cold. Okay, That's the thing about ice cream vendors. They'll use dry ice to keep their ice cream extra cold. In fact, that's one place you can get dry ice. We looked at the idea of condensation as well, where gaseous particles or gaseous particles come closer and closer together and they form a liquid. Uh, think about going to your favorite fast food place, soda bar, you know, big cup of soda, lots of ice. You go to the, the machine <coughs> and then after a while you're sitting there kicking back with your friends. You see all this what looks like sweat on the sides of the cup. That's actually condensation. Okay. So what you've got, you've got warm, moist air, so that means you've got to have humidity. You have a cold glass, so water molecules that are floating around in gas form, they start to condense, they're attracted to the cold, they lose that heat, okay, and as they lose that heat, they start to join up together, hydrogen bonds are forming, and that's where you get the condensation. And here we go, real world condensation. I should trademark the term real world, but I can't. This is what happened after a flood. What you're seeing there along the walls there is mold and mildew. Ew, really unhealthy stuff. But that's condensation. So we looked very fast at diffusion. We looked at condensation and we also looked at sublimation. All right, well, that's nice, but now we've got to talk about vapor pressure. Now, vapor pressure is the pressure of a substance that's in equilibrium with its liquids. Whew, wait, what? Let's work with this. The idea is this. The particles are evaporating and condensing at equal rates. It's happening at the same time. 
okay? Liquids in a sealed container can do this. Now it says show video. I do have a very quick video to show you guys of vapor pressure. I did it here, oh, I don't know, maybe about a week or two ago, okay? But here's the idea when we talk about vapor pressure. If you're looking inside a container that has a liquid, if you have a heat source that's, you know, it's being exposed to a heat source, think about that infrared heating lamp I had. Yeah, that big red one, the one that, oh, it makes it hot, temperature-wise hot, okay? And what that will do to the water inside the liquid, it will cause the water to evaporate, go from liquid to a gas. But what goes up must come down because eventually that gas water, that steam, if you will, is going to lose that energy. And as it loses that energy, guess what? It's going to start condensing and you're going to have a chance to see that. But what happens when water evaporates and it condensates at the same speed, at the same rate, that's where you get the vapor pressure. That's the whole idea about it, okay? Now, it says show video. You're gonna have a chance to see the video. You're gonna have to do that after this one, okay? So there should be two videos you'll have a chance to watch today. Now we gotta talk a little bit about boiling point. You've heard of boiling point. Uh, look at the boiling point of water, 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius. Well, what's going on with a boiling point? That's the temperature where water molecules go from being a liquid to being a gas. They end up getting enough energy to escape the pull of gravity, not just from the hydrogen bonds of the rest of the water molecules, but the gravity of the planet itself. You can, it can move a little bit up into the air. Now, the boiling point is the temperature of the substance. When its vapor pressure is equal to the pressure exerted on the surface of a liquid. So there's two pressures that you're looking at. There's the vapor pressure, which is what we get from evaporating and condensing at the same rate. Then we gotta look that it's gotta be equal to the pressure that's put on the surface of a liquid. And typically the boiling point is determined by using an open container. Now. Can we change the boiling point of water? Yes, we actually can. Well, how so? Well, we can alter the pressure uh, of the water. Wait, what do you mean by altering the pressure? Well, think about this. If you've been up to Big Bear and you've had to go boil water, let's say you're making a soup or you're making coffee or tea, whatever it is, it takes a little longer to boil the water up there at Big Bear than it does down here in Upland. Well, what's the difference between Big Bear and here in Upland? Well, Big Bear's got a lot more trees and they got animals, they got cabins, and it's a little more woodsy and wild, and, but that's not it. It is at a different elevation. Big Bear is about, I don't know, seven, between seven to 8,000 feet elevation. What does that mean? Uh, that means if we look at the number of air molecules pressing down on us from the atmosphere above us, what you're gonna find is there are less air molecules pressing down on us up at Big Bear than it is down here in Upland. Okay, there's more air molecules in Upland then Big Bear, I, I, I don't get it. Well, think about this. If the air molecules are pushing down on you, it's putting pressure, okay? So we're being put pressure on all the time by air. Every object here is, has pressure put on it. Every one of them, the desks, your purse, your cell phone, whatever it is you have, okay? And not okay, okay. All right, so that would mean that when you're boiling water down here, okay, you have to put in more, you have to put in more heat. You have to put in heat because it's harder for the water to go from a liquid to gas than it is up there. So what does that mean? That means if you put the temperature here, down here, it's going to take less time to get the water hot 
than it is up there at Big Bear. Because at Big Bear, you don't have as many air molecules pushing down on you, which means there's less pressure. If there's less pressure, what is easier for the water to do? The water will have an easier time escaping from the surface of the liquid out into the air compared to down here. So let's, let's look at it another way. Let's say we can magically count the number of air molecules. So let's say we got 16 trillion air molecules pushing down on us here for our water. Okay? So water has got to go through. That water molecule has got to go and deal with the pressure of some 16 trillion air molecules. Okay. Now we go up to Big Bear. Big Bear is less. So let's say it's 10 trillion air molecules. Okay? So there's a difference of 6 trillion air molecules it's going to be easier for the water to go through 10 trillion air molecules to go from liquid to a gas than it would for water down here in Upland to go from a liquid into a gas going through 16 trillion air molecules. So water has an easier time of escaping the liquid and become a gas up at Big Bear, but because of that, it, makes it, it takes it longer to go and actually boil the water to the temperature that we want compared to down here. So mountain cooking is actually different. You have to take that into account. So that's the idea behind the boiling point and where air pressure comes in. Now, a couple of things. There is something called the heat of vaporization. Wait a minute, what do you mean by vaporization? Think about evaporation. How much energy does it take to go from a liquid to a gas? Because it takes a certain amount of energy to do that. And the big idea here is when a liquid becomes a gas, it needs energy to escape the Earth's gravity away from the liquid. So when a liquid becomes a gas, it needs energy to escape the Earth's gravity away from the liquid. Okay, how do we measure this? Well, we measure this by a joule. A joule is a unit of energy. Okay, now a joule is very, 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 very tiny. Okay, so typically we'll measure in kilojoules or thousands of joules, but a joule is the energy needed to lift a one kilogram mass one meter off the ground against gravity. That would be a joule. Or the energy released as heat by a quiet person every one hundredth of a second. Or it's the kinetic energy of an adult human moving a distance about a hand span every second. This is a hand span right here for those people who are wondering. That, that, that's the hand span right there. Yeah, that's the hand span. You see, we, we take the hand span this way. Yeah, that's a hand span. Okay. So now I have the idea of what a joule is. What in the world is this? Well, this is looking at water and looking at how much energy does it take to change water from one state of matter to the other. So the heat of vaporization, let's look at this. This is temperature. This is the heat content. Okay, you can think about enthalpy. So here, this is the form of ice right here. Okay, so this is the form of ice. This is the form of liquid. And here it's in the form of gas. Okay, that's the form of gas. So the idea is, so we're looking at zero degrees Celsius here, 100 degrees Celsius here. Okay, and this obviously is, let's say, negative 50 Celsius for the sake of argument. So the idea is that when you are heating up the ice, okay, it comes to a certain point right here, okay, where it needs to overcome this that latent heat of fusion and change 100% ice into 100% liquid. You need a certain amount of energy in order to evaporate it. So we can say it's a safe bet to say that at zero Celsius, ice and liquid water can coexist. They can. It depends how much energy is involved in it, how much heat content, if you will. And this is called the latent heat of fusion. All right. Now, here we are at liquid, 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 liquid. Okay, here we are. We're at 100 degrees. We've been boiling it. Okay, and this, this thing does not take into account pressure at all. Just regular pressure. 
of one atmosphere. So now we've got this little hurdle to jump through. This is the heat of vaporization. Now they say latent heat of vaporization is the same idea. How much energy is absorbed when one kilogram of a liquid vaporizes at its normal boiling point? How much energy does it take to go from all liquid to all gas? That's the key. It's kind of like looking at the borders. Okay, here's the border between ice and liquid, but you have to have a certain amount of energy in order to cross over from ice to liquid. Here's the border between liquid and gas. You have to have a certain amount of energy in order to make the cross from ice to gas. All right. Now, heat of fusion, this is the thing we were talking about. The heat of fusion, how much energy does it take to change something that's ice into all, all, uh, from all ice to all liquid. How much energy does it take? Okay, so at the melting point, the temperature of a solid, when its crystal lattice begins to disintegrate, break apart, you add more energy to overcome the interparticle forces. Remember, the forces of attraction between atoms and molecules. The crystal lattice collapses to become a liquid. Okay, so we're kind of promoting a little chaos here. Okay, the freezing point, it's the temperature of the liquid as it begins to form a crystal lattice. So in other words, there is a freezing point where the temperature of a liquid is going to start to change. The molecules are realigning themselves that they're going to start becoming a more rigid structure. According to the kinetic theory of solids, that there's going to be a structure, the forces of attraction are going to become stronger now, then then the molecules or atoms, they're going to vibrate in place as part of that. Kind of like what I'm doing right now, I'm vibrating in place. This is how an atom or a molecule will behave in the kinetic theory of solids. That's the idea, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? Heat of fusion. This is the energy that's released as one kilogram of a substance solidifies at the freezing point. So the heat of fusion, the idea behind that is the energy that is given off, that is taken away from the liquid as it's going from a liquid into a solid. That's the idea. Okay? And with that, I believe this is one part of uh, chapter 10 that we are finished off with. Uh, it's not, I don't think it's the entire story. I still think I need to talk to you guys a little bit more about kinetic energy. But uh, this is dealing with the heat of fusion where you've got a melting point and a freezing point. And you, you know what? That melting and freezing point, oftentimes it'll be the same number. Yeah, it would be. Sometimes it is the same number, okay? And at this point, we have talked about heat of fusion. How much energy does it take to change something that's all ice, all solid, to all liquid, or vice versa? We've looked at this chart here that shows us a little bit about what does it take to go from ice to liquid to, to gas. And we looked at water as a great example of it. We talked about the heat of vaporization, how much energy do you need to change a liquid in the gas? All liquid to all gas. We talked about the idea of joule as a unit of energy, okay? And we also note that heat of vaporization, again, how much energy does it take to change all liquid to all gas? We talked about vapor pressure and boiling point as well. Again, the boiling point, it's a temperature where things happen. Okay, where the vapor pressure is the same as the pressure put on the surface of a liquid. We talked about the, we talked about the um, elevation differences in cooking, and we looked at vapor pressure here, pressure of a substance in equilibrium with its liquids, where the particles evaporate and condense at the same equal rates, and the liquid in a sealed container, we can do that. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end for it. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care until the next time.